Oh, hello. All right, there I am. I said, you guys beat me too. I was going to say, you may be seated, but you guys know the drill. But I'm going to have you stand in just a moment. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2. Getting a workout this morning. Ephesians chapter 2, as we talk uh, from Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, and this morning he, he is dealing with uh, our call from death to life. A poignant time, uh, when, the, when I mentioned the, the, the message of um, Proverbs last night, the point of that, I could have done better if I'd have refreshed on, on what the reading was, that nothing is trivial, even the small things of life. At the beginning, God was bringing order from chaos in Genesis. And everything we do, when we speak life, when we um, give peace in, the, peace in the midst of calamity at times like these, when we, when we exercise that, when we really believe what we say we believe, uh, it's bringing order to chaos. This is the nature of God, order to chaos. It's something that uh, secularism, atheism cannot account for. How does order come from chaos? Scientifically, it doesn't. It doesn't. It goes against the laws of nature. Order does not come from chaos. God brings order from chaos. And this one, from death to life. As we see death around us, it's part of us. Um, not just death as we know death, but just death in all things. That, that, that this world is broken, and every culture realizes that. And we're trying to find a fix, and we're... Looking in vain. And Paul reminds us of good news. That's what the gospel means. Remember that. <clears throat> the gospel means good news. And we're here to celebrate that. And it's easy to get trapped in bad news. It's easy for it to bring us down. Remember, Christians, you're not called to that. We have a different calling. To think differently from the world. Uh, to not get so agitated and anxious about all the circumstances going on around us. Because it's continually reminding us, what are we anchored in? Who are we anchored in? That's what we're here for every week. That's one reason I really believe God called us to gather together to be encouraged and reminded of this, because we so easily are distracted, are we not? Amen. Are we not? So let's join together in unity this morning, celebrating life and the good news that God has given us. So let's read, and we will dive in and, and pick this apart. There's a lot in these 10 verses in Ephesians. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. Stand with me as we read God's Word. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin. Now, we just went through chapter 1, which was talking about how God's relationship with us is one-sided. Basically, big idea, he doesn't need us, he wants you. He doesn't need you to complete him, he wants us and he pours his love on us so we might give his love to others, that we need him. We're in desperate need, and thankfully he is a gracious, giving God. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler who exercises authority over the lower heavens, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath, as others were also. Watch this in verse 4. But God, everybody say that together, but God, see the, the change, he's talking about us, now he jumps to God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with the Messiah, even though we were dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace. Together with Christ Jesus, he also raised us up and seated us in the heavens, so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace and his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God. Remember I talked about it being one-sided? This is a gift from God. Grace and faith are a gift from God. Not by works so that no one can boast. Verse 10, for we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you for the gifts of faith 
of, of grace that you came after us, that you come after us, that you are continually um, there, and yet we oftentimes choose destruction. So God, I pray you'd call us out of that. I pray for those of us who are chasing destructive things in life and ultimately ourselves that we look to you, the good king, who calls us to life. Help us. Help us walk in that life. We pray in your name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. I think I, I have the ESV in uh, my text this morning that I read to you as you were reading CSV. If some of you were confused there. Hopelessness and helplessness without Christ is t- what I titled this message. God helps those who help themselves. Who help themselves. You heard that one before? Some people think that a lot of people attribute things to the Bible that aren't the Bible. That is not from the Bible. That is from the ancient Greeks. Okay? Paul emphasizes just the opposite in this section, that God helps the helpless. Hear that? We are not self-made people. We, we just look around and see that's not working for us. That God helps the helpless. God helps those who call out to him. Even more, he helps his enemies who have transgressed his holy law, who have gone against them. As we talked about the beginning of this message, that this is written by a guy who was persecuting, who was going the total opposite direction. And God said, I'm going to appoint Paul to do my business, and he will burn out for my glory, for my name's sake. That God goes after even his enemies. You've heard the old saying, don't forget where you came from. Well, that's the two points I want you to grab this morning. All right? I want you to think about this. Number one, so you can leave and go, and I memorized the message. Here you go. Don't forget where you came from. You, you everyone got that one? Everyone say that. Don't forget where you came from. Don't forget where you came from. Point number one. Point number two, forget where you came from. All right? Everyone get that one? Point number two, say it. Forget where you came from. There you go. Now I'm going to explain that to you in just a moment. Look at verse 1 through 3 here. Then the, and it's funny, as you read this section, those of you who grew up in church, you probably, a lot of those verses were those ones you put to memory as a young child or, or at some point in life. These are, these are rich texts that, that we have had memorized um, or, or that ones that have been those verses that we put to our memory where people have told us you need to memorize this one. This is one of them. In verse 1 through 3, And you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler who exercises authority over the lower heavens. This is talking about Satan and the leader of this world, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts that we were by nature children under wrath and others were also. So Paul's reminding us here that sin, listen, is not just what we do that makes us sinners. It's our condition. Hear me? It's who we are, that we are born chasing after our own way. I remind you, I've used it over and over, we don't have to teach people to sin. Think about that one. We don't have to teach people to go our own way. We don't have to teach selfishness. We have to teach good. So you want to get that illustration down? Come hang out with my two-year-old for a little while. You'll get it. Um, No one has to teach mine, mine. Take a wiffle ball bat and pop another kid over the head. You don't have to teach that stuff, right? It's It's in us. We have to teach good. We have to teach manners. We have to teach order. We're good at chaos. Naturally, hang out with children. You'll get what I'm saying. You guys that are called to work with children, God bless you. Have mercy on you. That's a great thing. God has set you apart for that work. But you're seeing this, that we are by nature not orderly in that manner. We, don't, we by nature aren't kind to one another. Uh, we're about us from the gate, out of the gate we are. And the scripture says we are dead in our sin. We are without hope. What does dead mean? Dead. The, the, in the Greek, you look at what that means, it means that we are dead. Um, and uh, a, a dead man can't do anything. He's incapable And that's the point that he's building here to say we cannot reach for our own prescription. We cannot fix ourselves. We have needs. That we are helpless. So sin is not just what we do. It's our condition. We sin because we're sinners. I am reminded of 
And, and as I'm saying this, and point number one is don't forget where you came from. I'm reminded of a guy at Calvary, at where I grew up and dad pastored for how long? 11, 12 years. There was a man named Joe at Calvary. And Joe was a, a cowboy. If you had to picture what a cowboy looked like, sound like Joe. This is Joe. He, he talked, had this rugged voice, talks, talks real slow and a patient, gentle man. But Joe had a moment in his life where you see in the verse where it says, but God, where God stepped into Joe's life. And Joe was a, from what I know, and I'm just recalling this from being a, a, a kid growing up and hearing Joe's story, Joe was an alcoholic. Uh, he was not a kind man. It controlled him. But God stepped into Joe's life and made this hardened man who was addicted to alcohol and wasn't very kind to people become the most gentle, compassionate. You could just feel it oozing out of Joe. And when he prayed, you could hear it. You could feel it, this thankfulness to God for what he was not anymore. He had a but God moment in his life. You think, I'm going to say this later, the B.C., before Christ, after. Joe had that moment. Joe remembered, you could feel it in his prayer, his, his thankfulness, that he wasn't the man he once was. And he was a different person now. Radical change. And you could hear him when he prayed. It was, like, it was, it was, it was beautiful. I just, I, for some reason, that stuck out. You could see that grace clothed him. And he never forgot where he came from, and you could feel it. You could sense it. Listen, you give grace when you get to grace. And what I saw in Joe, this compassion for people and this love for people, was because he understood what he came from and who he once was. That he could give this to other people. We have to be careful of playing the, the, the mode where... Uh, and we, we do this oftentimes as Christians in our self-righteousness. We'll get stuck in, in hey, well, I'm a, you know, I, I've, I've done some bad things or, or I, I, you know, I was here, but at least I'm not like those people. And when I say at least I'm not like a certain person, probably somebody comes to our mind. And here's where things change when you get what I'm talking about here. Remembering where you came from, you could have been. Given any situation, you could have been anybody. That, that guy you go, well, I could never do that. Yeah, you could. Imagine being raised in what's going on across the world in, in something like that. Imagine, imagine being born into Taliban's family. What would you be? This is, but by the grace of God are you where you are. And I don't know how we let the Lord deal with that and figure that out. But this is a, a call to thankfulness for where you are and remembering what you could be. And here's the deal. I, I, I don't know who said it. We studied this weeks back on a Wednesday night. I remember a, a pastor said it. it might have been Keller in the Proverbs book that said, for the, the person, the closer we get to Jesus, the, the harder time we have pointing out other people's sin because ours becomes magnified in our life. Our sin becomes greater. We remember where we came from. We remember the things we deal with, and it helps us to identify the people sometimes that we're quick to throw stones at or quick to judge to go, I could be that person, or I was that person. So that group where we go, at least I'm not like them, you could be. And until you see that, I don't think you fully understand and comprehend grace, which we're going to spend a lifetime trying to figure out what grace is. That God freely gives us what we don't deserve. We don't, we don't understand that. But may we understand that we could be anybody. That those people we, that we're repulsed by, they're, they're, I can't believe they do that. I don't have that inclination or whatever it might be. We could be. We could be. If you're in another situation, we are all level in sinners, as sinners. We're born this way. But God. So may we remember that. I think, I get personal with you for a second. 
having a brother that dealt with the things that I saw him deal with, I, I, I saw even in, in dad's life, um, and I didn't plan to say this, but Matt dealing with addictions his, his entire life. And I remember dad standing here and us both saying, we, we did Matt's memorial service here, saying to people, a lot of the people that were here were some of Matt's friends and some of them were still stuck in addiction cycles. And dad was said these words. He said, we're not, we're not mad at you when you're wanting, we're wanting you to quit and stop going the way you're going. We, we, we love you. And we don't want you to be where Matt is right now. And my brother passed away from his battle with addictions. And, and I think this is what we're getting at. The more, the more I saw Matt, there would be sometimes some anger at what he's doing, but also going, could have been me. Could have been me. I think had I not lived in my brother's shadow of seeing the choices he made that were destructive, I might have made those same choices. I am no better. We are all one decision away from destruction. You hear me? Amen. So instead of us putting ourselves up, and, and, and even in, in, in and I know there's, there has to be a call for light and darkness, and we have to be people who say this is wrong, and we got to take a stand, but we do it with, with a tear, with compassion, knowing that we're capable given a certain situation. So I think in my, my walk with Jesus changed from me sometimes getting angry or judging my brother at certain times to being compassionate and going, that could be me. To the person on the side of the road holding up a sign that you go, I'd never do such a thing. Could be you. You could be in those shoes. But by the grace of God, that's right, David. Let me tell you one more story, and this was for free. I didn't, I didn't plan on saying this, but I worked at, in Lakeland with our, our school would go volunteer at a homeless shelter. And this homeless shelter was the best. It's called Lighthouse Ministries in Lakeland, downtown Lakeland. And they would rehabilitate people. And I've never seen a program so smoothly run where they help people homeless that would um, be rehabilitated, get jobs and things like that. The head guy that ran this helped our students. And uh, he, he guided them. And I got to talking with him and hearing his story. And I don't even remember his name. I just remember his story. I said, how did you end up here? And he was an awesome guy. And he said, I was married um, with a lovely wife, three children. He said, I had a job, had a house, everything going smooth. He said, and then one day my wife and three children were killed in a car accident. He lost them all like in a moment. Three kids and a wife. And he said, I had a nervous breakdown and just started drinking it away. And he said, I couldn't cope, couldn't deal with life. He said, I ended up homeless. Normal guy, had it, basically said it, everything was going good. One moment changed his life, and he ended up being homeless. He said being strung out on drugs and everything else just to, so he could cope with life. And now he's rehabilitated, and he's helping others get out of those situations. But he said, you don't know the stories that are here that come through these doors of people just like me and you that one moment changes everything. So that's why I call us to be careful. We're quick to, to, to look aside and we're quick to cast judgments. And we don't know everyone's story. It could have been us. And that was the first of those stories I've met with a guy like that. And I'm going, that's me. <laughs> and we're so quick to cast people aside. Guys, we are all on a level plane. We're all dead. We are all without hope but God. Look at uh, verse 4. So don't forget where you came from. And may you, see, may you have compassion as we're called to, to bring life, to, to, to be, bring righteousness into our culture. We are citizens of America, and we're called to bring righteousness to America. We, this is a unique situation. We're looking at, at, at uh, the Bible. They didn't live quite like we lived in and, and, and this kind of culture um, where they had this... Uh, the freedoms that we had. They were much more persecuted, much more under, under much more exile. Um, so we are called to speak into our culture, but at the same time, be aware that we were once like those uh, without hope or those who were chasing after their own way. Okay? But God, verse 4, 
But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love he had for us, made us alive with a Messiah, even though we were dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace. We ended in verse 3, you see that? It was all about us and calamity and folly and going our own way and, and, and this being chaotic to verse 4, but God has started. Even if this happened to you at a young age, right? so you might not have one of those Joe moments I talked about where there was this radical change where you were like this terrible you know, person you would never want to be. Maybe you were changed when you were young. It's still but God. He has shaped who you are, maybe kept you from things, maybe kept you from chasing after that folly. This is your condition. Remember that. So someone like me, I, was, I, was, I started following a God. There's really not a time where I don't remember where I was taught, you know, Jesus is Lord, and I've surrendered to that at a young age. So even more so, I should say, but by the grace of God. I'm thankful to grow up in a family where I knew Jesus was a creator and has made this world, and he loves us, and mercy and grace, these are, this is, that was a but God moment. And I was still, at a young age, dead in my trespasses, and God woke me up and made me alive. For all have sinned, all are sinners, but not all are set apart and joined with Christ. His great love, it says in those verses, rich in mercy, and that we are made alive. Do you hear the joy in those words? So the first half of the, this chapter, this is the B.C. A.D. chapter. And A.D., if you know, is a Latin term. I don't know if I'll say it correctly. It's Anno Domino, Domina, Domina. Who spoke Latin over here? I hear you. Year of our Lord, okay? So I'm just going to say after Christ, though, okay? Or before Christ and after he came. Year of our Lord is what that means, A.D. means. Hear those words, though, once Jesus shows up here in this chapter. But God, rich in mercy, made alive. Do you hear the joy here? So if we live as sinners, we are deprived of joy. Do you see the despair in the old life? And now what happens in these words here of Paul's penning, and once we're made alive, the gospel made us right. We were fallen and broken, and Christ is our mediator to bring us back, to point us to God, to point us towards life. Look, we don't dwell anymore in our deadness. So, so the point I'm saying with this, I want you to think about, remember where you were, remember what you came from, but forget where you came from at the same time, is we are no longer called in the scriptures sinners anymore. Do you get that? Even though we continue to sin, we are made alive in Christ. And the Bible calls us, and I struggle with this one, calls us saints. So we have to keep a healthy perspective of that old life. And I'm going to unpack that here. But also knowing who we are in Christ, that we are saints. If we have placed our trust, if we have believed on Jesus, we are saved, we are called saints. We're not sinners anymore. Even though we continue to sin and God's working this stuff out of us, we have our sights set anew on Christ, on his kingdom, on goodness, on who he is. You are alive in Christ. So some of you might have wondered as you read that, you say, we're sinners and we sin. But then Paul refers to us, he started this, this letter calling them saints, to the saints here. And these aren't perfect people, obviously, because this letter goes on just to correct things. And say, here's the order in the chaos. Here's how you live as a family. Here's how you live as friends. Here's how you treat your bosses. Here's how you treat your coworkers. That's what Ephesians is all about. Saying how to bring order, gospel order, Christ order into chaos. And not follow man's ways, the world's ways, follow God. He calls them saints. So he's pointing out their sin, but calling them saints. And I'll give you a little illustration in just a moment to get that across. We are alive in Christ. Verse 8. Let me read that. For you are saved by grace through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God. Echoing back to what we said last week. And he says there in the latter half of that, not from works so that no one can boast. And we have to be careful of that because even in our act of choosing and making a choice and saying yes to God, remember what we talked about in the past two weeks, that even everything, our capacity to live, to breathe, it's given by God. 
the floor you're, I'm going to say standing on, you're not standing, you're sitting, made by God. The clothes you're wearing, made by God. The matter of this world, everything made by God. It's given by God. Verse 10 says, we are saved for good works, not by good works. Hear that? You got to get that right. You got to get that in check. And I know we can get those sorely out of order. Let me put, put something as we think about grace and faith being a gift. And this might be a little flimsy illustration, but I think it'll make sense. We are able to give back to God because he's given us gifts to give back to him. You get that? So verse 8 says, it is by grace we have been saved through faith. These are gifts. And then we live a life. What does Jesus say? Love God, love others. That basically it's saying, and before that, we're incapable of doing that until God gives us the gift of faith and grace. Do you get that? And I was thinking about, like, how does this make sense? How does this reflect in my life? And I remembered back to the days of Santa's secret shop. All right? When I was a kid, we had this, it was the, the highlight of the year in an elementary school called Santa's secret shop. And I, 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 as far as I can remember, kindergarten back up through elementary school, we went to Santa's secret shop. Did anybody have a Santa's secret shop at Christmas time? Where their school, man, y'all's poor schools. Ours had that. In Arcadia, Florida, it had the Santa's Secret Shop, so we were doing something right. They'd, they bring in toys and gifts, not toys, because we were buying, well, there were toys there, because you could buy for anybody you wanted to, but we got to get out of class, right? And they'd take us to buy things for Christmas for our family. And that was Santa's Secret Shop. So I'd buy some knickknacks mom didn't need and some <laughs> junk dad didn't need and whatever, um, whatever I thought would make them happy, I'd buy. Now, remember, I was a first, second grader, third grader. I didn't have a job. I was broke. All right? What wasn't in the cards. Mom and dad didn't put me in child labor and make me get a job at that age. So I didn't have any money. So what did I do? I went to mom and dad and asked them for money to stay in a secret shop so I could go buy them gifts with their money that they didn't need. They didn't need those gifts. Mom did not need that little uh, ceramic bird uh, on her table that I bought her. I don't know what I bought you from Santa's Secret Shop, but it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily good stuff. Now, when I did that, there was joy. Mom and Dad gave me the money. I got to go out of class. Got to get gifts. I thought it was the best thing ever. I thought I was the best gift giver of all time. I had joy in getting the gifts. I had joy in giving the gifts. I was the man because I had to give my mom and dad stuff from Santa's secret shop. Brought me extreme joy. I felt generous, even though it was mom and dad's buck. You get that? I, I had pleasure in the giving, and my parents, oddly enough, enjoyed the receiving. That their kid did this, that they bought it from them. You know, bought, took time and picked this out, and I even wrapped it myself, and it, it was all terrible. But to mom and dad, it was a beautiful thing. Why? Because they love me, because I'm their kid. Is that not what we're seeing here? <laughs> God doesn't need anything from us. Nothing. But God gives us this gift to give back to him, that we receive joy and pleasure, and we partake in what he's already done. And he loves us and takes joy back in it. Beautiful picture of, of parenting here. This is why God is our good, good father. We are saved for good works, not by good works. And we're reminded of that, that sometimes we think, remember last week, oh, what a good boy am I, that there was something in us that recognized something better to choose God and follow God. No, 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 no. Paul reminds us and smacks us down many times, go to Romans 9, where he's reminding us, it's not you, it's God owns everything. Amen. It's just a gift. You can just, I don't know why, thank you, God. You can't say, well, I recognize it, and that guy didn't. No, you didn't. This is what he reminds us. It is by grace, through faith, you've been saved. A gift from God, so you can't boast about it. Even in your walking and out, praying a prayer, whatever you, you, you think you did, it was a gift from God. There's no room for you in it. So now we can look at the person on the side of the road or that person even in our, the people we're angry with right now, that well, what are we doing to, in, in this part of the world, in our country, and all this stuff, and the people we get frustrated with, with and just know that, that I, I could be them. 
but by the grace of God. Because there was nothing in me that recognized God to be better. Nothing better in me that made me where I am, but by the grace of God. I can't explain it, but I'm thankful. And now I will continue to give those good gifts to others too, because God has given them to me. So forget where you came from. Don't lie and bask in that. But never use your old life as an excuse. So forget, but don't forget. Your sins are remembered no more, the scripture says. I remember hearing time after time pastors coming in back in the day, and some of you have probably sat through some of these where they had this testimony where they spent more time talking about their old life and trying to draw you in to how bad they were than their new life. And we have to be careful of that. And the scripture is really painting us the opposite, that we don't hold on to our old, we don't brag about our old life, but the opposite of that, that, that we've been made new. Never let your past be a chain. Remember, your guilt is gone. God is looking not at your past, but looking at Christ and what he has done and that he has taken all that away from you and remembered it no more. There was a song, an old contemporary Christian song back in the day, Stephen Kirsch Chapman penned, and it said, remember your chains, but remember your chains are gone. So keep them in arm's length. Don't look back. Don't dwell on it too much. Don't forget where you came from. Look ahead, but don't forget where you came from because that reminds you what you're capable of. That reminds you of that person that is without hope. That we could be them. So I'm going to wrap this up with this. Listen to the ADBC moment here, okay? Compare and contrast. Verse 1 through 3, verse 4 through 6. So BC, old life. A.D., new life, when God steps in. B.C., we were dead. A.D., we are now alive. Before, we were enslaved. The contrast here, this is, remember, I've got teacher in my blood, so we're comparing and contrasting. You guys remember that, doing that in English class? We were objects of wrath. Now, we are objects of grace. We walked among the disobedient before Christ. Now we have fellowship and union with Christ. Before we were under Satan's dominion, the ruler of this world, it says, but now we are in union with Christ. See that? Hear those, that good news? New life, we're alive, we're enthroned, we are objects of grace, fellowship with Christ, union with Christ. Let me uh, close with this little illustration. Let me bar somebody here. Um, I'm going to actually bar people. James, can you come up here? You're going to be up here anyway in just a moment. And uh, let me see who else I can use here. Um, Lydia, come here, please. <laughs> All right, these are just symbols. I did not pick them by anything. But James, I'm going to have James represent Hitler over here, okay? All right, Lydia, stand over here. And we're just, I'm just using you guys as objects right now, okay? Nothing, no character w- was used in the picking of this or anything, okay? Because I live with this one, and she's going to rep- Okay, so, so uh, all right, just, just, just the presence, not the person. Don't relate it. Don't, don't read into this too much, people, okay? James is a good dude. Um, if we have Hitler on this end of the spectrum, and Jesus in his perfect righteousness over here, Okay? And I borrowed this from R.C. Sproul. If you want to look it up, he does it a lot more articulated than than I am this morning. But I want you to think about this. If that's Hitler, because if you could just think of a terrible human being, okay? You think Hitler. Jesus, perfect in righteousness, glorified, uh, sinless, the only human to walk, God in the flesh, sinless, him here. Me, uh, if I represent, let me say, who, who, who the Bible say was the best man to ever walk the earth? John the Baptist, right? Said he was the best man. You could throw Paul in here, anybody. As a human being following Jesus, okay? Let's say before Christ, here. All right? Here. Even once I know Jesus, as I walk this earth, there's something called sanctification where God's shaking the old out. Remember, remembering where you came from, yet pursuing the new. I am still, remember, Christ's perfect Righteous, good, John called God love. This is love in the flesh walking over here. 
I am still more akin to this over here than I am to him. Okay? I'm still closer to here than I am to Christ. The good news is that when we walk with Christ, he sets our eyes on him. Christ is the one that is seen. God imputed Christ and his grace on us. that He sees his perfect record, not mine. One day, when I'm fully glorified with Jesus post this life and not struggling with the things I struggle with now, where I tend to look back at my old life and even am tantalized with it. One day, I will be here when I'm fully glorified. When I'm out of this earth and I'm with Jesus and I'm fully his. But until then, remember, we are more here than we are here. The good news is he does not see my record, my past. He sees Christ. And God is making us new. So remember that. Remember that no matter how good we are, no matter how much we're getting right, we are more here. We are far away from the righteousness of Christ and the goodness of, of him. He gives it to us. You guys can, James, you can go ahead and sit up there if you want. I'm wrapping up. That that makes you believe I'm wrapping up here, right? James is like, thank you, Lydia. That, listen, that through this sanctification process, we're moving closer to Jesus, but eventually we will be fully there with him. We are fully there with him. Jesus, perfect in his righteousness, sinless and glorified. We will be glorified too, fully glorified with him when we leave this place and we're home with Christ. We were sinners in the past tense. The scripture focuses more on saints than sinners. Remember that. I know you have a hard time calling yourself saints, but you're a saint not because of you. You were made a saint because of him, because of Christ. And we will never be the same. The scripture says the old has gone. What does it say? The new has come. So let me ask you this question this morning. Have you forgotten where you came from? Now that lands two different ways. I want you to think of that. Have you forgotten where you came from? Remember, yet forget. Look ahead. Keep your eyes on Christ. The old is gone. The new has come. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much that in your eyes we are called saints and we wrestle with that because we know our hearts We know we're still akin to going the wrong direction. Even though we love you, as the scripture says, as Paul, the writer of this this letter says, I want to do what I don't do. And I do what I don't want to do. We still have this struggle. Even though we have this love for you, we have this love for things that are right and good, the old us creeps up. God, I'm thankful that you forgive that you, as a good father, um, pick us up, lead us towards the path of righteousness. God, may we do that this morning. May we confess. May we repent. May we set our eyes on you. And remember that we don't do this in our own power. We need you. We need your help. And some of us, for the first time, need to cry out this morning and just say that, God, I've been trying it on my own. It's not working. I need your help. So God, pray you be with us. Holy Spirit, I pray you move inside of us and work. And and may our hope, may our rest, may our life be in you. We pray it in your name. Amen. I'll tell you what we're going to do this morning. Um, We're going to just sing. Let's sing out of here. And and Julie um, is going to come and lead us in a song. I will be up front if anybody wishes to pray. Um, You guys just sing. And again, I'm here to talk to at any point. This was a good message that we need to hear. Ephesians chapter 2. Go home and read it again. Be reminded of that as you look into chaos around you. um, While we're broken, while we're saddened, there's hope. And there's hope for you. And some of you go, man, if there's hope for me, there's hope for anybody. Right? And there's hope for this world. And God is making all things new. Remember, God is still on his throne. And don't let the, the fears and the people playing on your fears pull you down too much. Remember that. Remember that we are made alive, and God is working for our glorification. 
that one day everything will be made new, and one day we will be fully glorified. And part of being fully glorified is going through trials, that shaking that stuff off in our lives, right, to make us more like Christ. And uh, that, that is the full glorification. There's a purpose. God does not waste a hurt. Remember that. Hold to that this week as you think about the things going on in your life, in the world around you. He's on his throne and he's good. Think on that. Rest on that. Let's stand together and sing. I uh, saw Eugene Peterson, who passed away, the guy who penned the message. I've talked about him a little bit. He was asked a question, how do we give answers to the violence in our world, the madness in our world, the violence that's going on around the world? This was 10 years ago. He was asked by an interviewer, and he didn't even hesitate. He said, the cross. That's an answer to the violence. Think about that. That God used this heinous tool of death to bring life. And there's a scene in the Passion of the Christ where Jesus is carrying his cross, and it's one that always sticks in my mind and wrecks me. And his mother runs up to him and wants to help him, and he looks at her, and he quotes from Revelation, Behold, I'm making all things new. Amen. That's the answer, y'all. Don't get caught up in the media and the hoopla and the anxiety of this world. He's got the answer. He's making all things new. Through our folly, God is working. So let's pray and thank him for that. Receive your benediction this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. He is our answer, guys. Go out of here with hope. In Jesus' name, amen.